Good morning. Here we are on day three. I, I, I just can't believe it. The, the days just go so fast. Every day has been fabulous. I was in my pajamas after about an hour after it was over yesterday. Um, but we're getting a lot of fabulous feedback, which really makes me happy. Some people are asking about the caregiver song. Uh, that song was written for me by a good friend a few years back. Well, more than a few years back. Um, so I'm going to put that on my website for a download for anybody that would like to download that song because it's just a fun song. Um, also, any other questions that you have about anything with the conference or anything else that I talked about, please remember you can just email me at lindaburhands at aol.com and I will surely answer your questions. So we've been very excited about the feedback. People are saying they're happy. They want more. Um, we're all, we're already planning the next conference, but I'm not talking about it for eight weeks. <laughs> so I am very, um, proud to, uh, introduce Deb Inbach. Uh, Deb is from Accent Care, formerly Seasons Hospice. Uh, I am actually on the board there and they are an absolutely wonderful, wonderful organization. Hospice is such an important thing and people are just seem to be afraid of it. And there's nothing to be afraid of. So uh, take it away, Deb. We'll unmute yourself. Uh, there we go. There we go. Yeah. So good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for um, for inviting me in to speak, Linda. And um, I really am excited to share all about hospice. For anybody who would love to listen, um, it is my um, it's my passion. And for most hospice providers, you will understand that it's it's their passion as well. Um, I am going to switch to a share screen. Uh, bear with me one moment while I do that. And how do I unhide my? Uh, we go. Share screen. What did you share? When I went into my three little pins. Okay. I did hide self view. Yes. Um, oh, try to so see just hide self view. Mm -hmm. Are we okay, Lisa? Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So um, thank you again. And um, am I sharing my screen? I don't see my screen up. We see it. Oh, you do? Okay, perfect. Or I see myself, which is a little frightening. But um, <laughs> so I'm here to speak to you. Lynn was very specific. She goes, I just want people to know that hospice is not a dirty word. It is not bad. Um, it has a lot to offer. And I hope through at the end of this presentation, you will be able to say, wow, um, I didn't realize that about hospice. So let me go to the next slide. This is a picture of Piper Vanderlee. She is our director of patient experience. Um, and this is a really great picture of what hospice is. Um, for this person, um, she was brought to our hospice from a hospital. She was brought to our hospice house from a hospital. And um, she didn't live in this county. Her family was out of this county. Her family could not afford to come to this county to visit her. So any efforts at placement in our county would have been very difficult. Um, one of the things that she loved to do was to go to Clearwater Beach when she visited our county. And we realized that she wouldn't have many opportunities for this moving forward. And um, we had two goals for her. One goal was to get her to Clearwater Beach, no matter how hard that would be for us. And then the other goal was to get her back home. And I'm happy to report that we were able to get Stacy to Clearwater Beach. She had, a, you'll see a picnic basket right there. She had a picnic basket filled with um, corn dogs, her favorite thing, and mm -hmm. coleslaw and um, some lemonade. So we were able to give that to her, that gift of, of life to her, and we were able to get her placed back in her county and her family was be able to be with her um, in her final days. I believe Stacy is still alive. So she's had a wonderful hospice journey. Just some, some kind of hard facts um, about hospice. Where did hospice come from? 
Um, it's been largely a volunteer movement all throughout um, the world. Um, prior to the United States opening their first hospice, there was a pioneer named Dame Cicely Saunders and she came to Yale and she talked about uh, dying and specialized care that dying people need. It was completely opposite anything that anybody had heard. And it took quite a number of years for us to wrap our arms around it. And the next person who did wrap their arms around it was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who most of you are probably familiar with. Um, and she wrote uh, on death and dying. I know that was a mandatory read for my nursing school. Most uh, physicians have to read it. Most clinical people are required to read that. Um, most people have read it regardless of your, your profession. So that's a very good book that introduced to us the stages of death and dying, the grief stages. Um, in 1974, Florence Wald, two pediatricians and a chaplain were bold, brave, and uh, they, they decided they were gonna establish a hospice in Connecticut, and they did so. The, um, the political people identified, I apologize, um, my hand slipped off my slide. The political people um, found out about it and they were looking for funding because they thought this is a wonderful thing, but it failed. So then we go to 1978 and the government took notice, hospice was growing. Um, and then the US Department of Health and Welfare initiated um, to identify and report the findings of the hospice movement. It's almost like it was a, um, uh, a 60s or, you know, well, it was in the 70s, but it's almost like it was a, a movement that maybe shouldn't be happening or needed, needed some oversight. Um, so in 1979, uh, HICFA, uh, the Healthcare Financing Administration in Maryland initiated a pilot program for 26 hospices in 16 states. And that really um, springboarded the hospice movement in the country. In 1982, Congress enacted the Medicare hospice benefit. They realized that hospice had been volunteer, hospice had no standards of care, hospice was whatever it was in the moment for that hospice group of people who were providing the care. And um, they felt that they needed to give hospice its due, establish some standards of care, and to reimburse people for the care that we were providing. At the end of this uh, presentation, I hope that you will be able to identify some of the important components of the Medicare hospice benefit, understand the type of care that we provide and realized that there's significant expertise that exists for you in hospice care. Appreciate the important ways hospice improves life and adds to end of life, and be able to identify when you need a hospice and be more comfortable reaching out to see how hospice may benefit you or your loved one. So I wanna start with honoring life. Um, Seasons Accent Care um, has a mission statement and it's honoring life, offering hope. And if we do those two things, then we are doing our job then we are doing our passion and we are doing everything we need to do to support the patient and the family in their journey. If you look at that picture, any one of those people around that table could be a hospice patient. It could be the lady waving the flag who may have breast cancer or uterine cancer. It may be one of the ladies standing there who may have um, heart disease. It may be the gentleman who may have <laughs> Parkinson's disease. You never know who the hospice patient is. And that's, that's really important because we wanna honor life. And for this family, we provided a veteran pinning to honor the life of the gentleman standing there. He was an army veteran and very dedicated to the military, very patriotic man. And that was a big part of his life. And his family was thrilled when we said we wanted to honor his life by having this veteran pinning to recognize him. 
he participated in singing the army uh, fight song. And he also uh, participated, he received a, um, a certificate and a flag pin that we give all of our veterans. There are a few more things that we would do with a veteran um, to honor his life in death. And um, we connect with people when the time comes at end of life to ensure that he has all the veteran honors that can be provided to him in his moment. And that makes such a big difference for a person. Absolutely. And it, yeah. gives, it gives the family so much to hold on to. It really yeah. does. I love this picture. And this picture is about honoring life. And this gentleman, he did get a veter veteran pinning that day. Um, I admitted this, this gentleman to hospice, um, I'm going to say maybe three years ago. And he was such a gracious man and just so, um, so private yet. So just so personable. And he, when we say people love life, I think everybody loves life. Most everybody loves life. Um, but you can see what the smile on his face, he's really loving that moment. And when we look at hospice care, we look at making those moments special and meaningful to the person and their family. And I just love that picture for it. This picture that I share with you, um, this is my reframing hope or offering hope uh, picture. When you look at this picture, you see a couple, you assume they're a married couple and they're fishing. Maybe, maybe it's a fishing wish. Um, the story behind this, um, these are two strangers. And we found out through our nursing team that both loved fishing, both had missed fishing, both were not in good medical condition. And we decided we needed to put together a special day for them. They made great friends. That day they connected on a level and for a good number of months after this trip, they corresponded, they called one another Yes, they were, they were both married, they had family, but they were special friends and they had a special bond. And that's the type of hope that we would like to reframe for people because we're not marching into death to put our arms around death. We're walking toward death with a family in their journey to offer them hope and to reframe what hope looks like for them. It might not, for a 48 year old woman who's got uterine cancer, and two children and a husband. Hope is very difficult to reframe. We change it from, I'm going to see my children graduate and get married and live their long lives, to I'm going to spend whatever days I have left in quality time with my children. And a great example of that is a very dedicated staff uh, I ran a hospice back in Maryland and my staff were taking care in the inpatient center of a woman who was about uh, 38 years old and she had devastating pancreatic cancer. And this woman had, we knew she had days to maybe a week or two left. Her father came to me, devastated. He's got two grandchildren he has to raise now. And in talking to him and talking to his daughter, we got to know them personally and got to know what was important for them. She mentioned to me that she wanted, well, not to me, she mentioned to the nurses and the staff there that she wanted to take her kids to the beach. She really had to have that last wish of taking her kids to the beach. And when the team came out of the room, they reported that to us. And we all looked there, looked stunned because we knew we could not, she could not go to the beach. It would be just, just too difficult. So we, the staff got together and through their creativity and their passion, um, they closed off one of our empty rooms. And within a few days, they created a beach environment for her and her kids. The kitchen made virgin margaritas, 
They cooked beach food, corn dogs, all kinds of things, French fries. They had vinegar back in Maryland. Vinegar is a big thing on French fries. And they had all the kids special, special foods and uh, the patients special foods. They turned up the temperature in the room. They decorated the entire room. They had a plastic pool with sand and they buried seashells for the kids. That mom had her moment at the beach. And it brought tears to our eyes to watch her just soaking in her children that day. Mm -hmm. And she declined very quickly afterwards. And her father was so grateful for those moments. And that's what hospice is. My heart, you have me crying now. <laughs> it's hard not to cry. It really is. Yeah. It's hard not to cry because we reach out for those moments that are so important and so, um, so cherished. And we try to give value and to bring people to those moments. And it's not, we don't focus on the illness. Right. I think that's the big difference. And it's okay to cry. And it's okay to cry. We embrace it. One of my, um, my best friends, when I was very sad, she looked at me and she said, you of all people should know there's strength in tears. Yes. And I share that with people because boy, is there strength in tears. Yeah. In hospice, we support you. We prepare you in the face of your grief. We're a passionate team that is there to support you. This is not a job. We're there to support you to find what's really important for you. And through the emotional, spiritual, and psychosocial support that we give, we make that promise to you that we will provide the support that you will allow us to, to give you. We also open doors to model meaningful death and to remove the images of death that people have, whether it's through media or video games or whatever. I recall an instance in my early days when I was an on-call nurse and I was called, it was a tough week for me. I had two patients die back to back young women with breast cancer and my sister was just diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh. And I walked into one home and um, the lady was having trouble breathing and her husband was there. Her son was downstairs and her parents were there. And um, I worked with them and I, you know, got her symptoms under control. And I went downstairs to talk to, uh, to him and to her parents and they shooed her, her child away and told him to go to his room. He was 10, um, looked at, looked as scared as could be. And, um, I talked to them, not necessarily about the symptoms, but about her son. And at the end of that visit, they couldn't bring themselves to sitting at bedside with the boy. But I asked them if I could. And we sat there and he held his mom's hand and he talked to her. And he had his moment that he needed. Yeah. That sometimes families can't do. And it's okay. Yeah. Deb, somebody just asked in the chat, how do you feel about end of life doulas? We partner with end of life doulas. We do. We welcome them. Um, they really, I've worked with one end of life doula and um, she really paved the way for us. She got involved very early when someone got their preliminary diagnosis. I mean, she had been with them for a little over a year. And then they were brought under hospice care. She had done a lot of our work for us. Um, all the important things that we need to do to get things squared away, like um, advanced directives and powers of attorney and all those things, they were already established. So really, we, we came in and um, with her help, uh, we helped um, this family journey through end of life. So absolutely, we love end-of-life doulas. We, um, we have a volunteer vigil program that we're currently building. We have our orientation coming up in um, a couple of weeks, I believe. 
And we have to have a hospice volunteer uh, volunteer for six months before they're ready to take the, uh, the volunteer vigil uh, role. So we, t- we teach and train them about end of life and how they can help and support a family in the final days. Wow. Yeah. So helping people live their final days by reframing life for them and for you. Let me know if anything else pops up in the in the chat. Yeah, I'm watching it for you. Don't worry. Okay, good. So um, one of the things that I really do um, with my team, um, people do not like when you say do not resuscitate. You know, we have to ask, do you have a do not resuscitate? Um, the doctors and the hospitals and the physicians, they all say you need to do a DNR. And people are so reluctant to do that. And I wonder why it is. We talk about that a lot. And it's really a very uh, negative projection of what may or may not be required with hospice. We take patients all the time who are not yet able to sign a do not resuscitate form. It's our job to walk them through the journey and to help them realize that it's not a bad word. That is not a dirty phrase. I like to rephrase it to allow natural death. And boy, does that have a different connotation, allowing natural death. That tells me that you're not going to withhold. Do not resuscitate says we're not going to do this. And people ask, well, what if she has a urine infection? We'll treat a urine infection. What if she has pneumonia? You know, we'll probably treat it, but we'll also talk about it. We'll see, we'll see what the benefit is. We always go into conversations with risk versus benefit. And if at the end of the day, somebody wants antibiotics, we will do antibiotics. If it's absolutely important, because we don't want anybody's end of life to be discussed like if she'd only had those antibiotics. We don't want regrets. There's a couple of things in the chat. Um, Uh I'll read them all and you can answer them how, you know, as you want. One is how does hospice work in a nursing home? The second one is when I had to sign the DNR, I felt like I was giving in. And the last one says, feels like a deliberate choice to cause someone's death. I signed my loved ones this morning. Oh, my advanced God. Directive. That's a really hard place to be. And I'm sorry that you're, you're there. Um, it does. When, when you do that, it feels like you're giving up. It feels like people are forcing you to put your name on that line. And I think if it were only explained as allowing natural death, as allowing, we're very, you know, the difference between hospice, the, the textbook difference between hospice and acute care is um, acute care is curative in nature. Hospice is palliative and comfort care. So while what, we're not going for the cure, we are very aggressive with symptom management. And if you, you have confusion because you have a urine infection, we're going to treat the urine infection if it makes sense for you. So allowing natural death is allowing natural death, but not withholding treatment by any means. And just because you sign a DNR doesn't mean we're going to start morphine. Everybody knows that morphine worked. Um, I'll get to that a little bit later. How do we practice in a nursing home? Um, We treat it like a patient's home because that is where they're living. We collaborate with the nursing staff. Um, we, our doctors, our hospice doctors do not have privileges necessarily in all nursing homes. So um, you would retain your, hosp- your, your regular doctor in the nursing home. And that doctor would tell me whether or not he wants me to manage the entire patient's care or just the hospice end of it even with that doctor on record, even if he says to us, I want you to do everything for the patient, we still collaborate with him. 
because he's the attending physician. So the, the care continuum that you have, whether it's in a nursing home or assisted living, that continues to exist and we work with them. Did that answer your question? I think so. We have another one here that says uh -huh. quality instead of quantity. I repeated this a lot to a husband of a lady I cared for. He got close with the staff at her assisted living and he was a doctor. Once he understood that it was better to have shorter good days than more bad days, he signed the paper. Yes. And then another person said, when the hospice social worker and nurse explained that if chest compressions were used to revive a patient with cardiac duress and then revived, the most likely will have great pain from possible broken ribs. That happened to me. So then I signed the DNR for my husband. Yes. You know, we do, um, nurses tend to go into the vivid descriptions of CPR. You've seen it on the television um, and things do happen in CPR. You can, you will break ribs um, to do effective CPR. You can puncture organs below the ribs and um, a healthy person surviving resuscitation. Um, I think the survival, I don't know what the survival rate is anymore because they have all these fancy things uh, to help them. But um, the survival rate is, is, not a hundred percent, nowhere near a hundred percent. Um, for somebody who has an illness for my age, 63, healthy, don't take any medications. The likelihood of me surviving resuscitation drastically reduced because of my age and I'm healthy. If I have hypertension or heart disease, we're looking at most people surviving resuscitation with meaningful life, less than 1%. Wow. So when we look at that, people think that they're going to get resuscitated and they'll have mama back the way she is. And that just doesn't happen with people who have life-limiting illnesses. Yeah. yeah, you're right. We have, I, I pulled this picture of the team because this is what we do. We don't just nilly, willy nilly give hospice care. Weekly, we come around the table and we talk about patients and we talk about their loved ones and we talk about the struggles in the home or the nursing home. We talk about some of the barriers that exist and we establish plans around those barriers and we try to do the best job for you that we can. We, um, we have a little banner in our uh, IDG room and it says um, it's the patient or family. And we keep that chair there because even though the patient and family isn't sitting around the table, I want to make sure our conversations honor that patient and family every single day that we sit around that table. And our, our goal is to guide you through choices so that your wishes are heard as a top priority. Any more questions? No, we're good. Okay. But one person just said, wait a second. Okay. As a nurse, I had difficulty letting go of his doctors and relying on the one in charge of hospice. I now know I have, I have now been with hospice for my husband for six weeks and I am feeling more at peace. And then the other person said, I had difficulty with my mom and me co co coordinating with nursing home for hospice. It, um, I'll, I'll take the first comment first. Um, the, um, I, when I hear that you have to kind of let go of your hospice doctor and go with, or the, the primary care doctor that you've had a relationship with for so long and then go with the hospice doctor and you had difficulty with that. Um, uh, that's not, that's not what should happen. You have relationships with doctors and we it, accent care hospice puts great value on the uh, primary care provider because that person has usually known that patient and that family for a long time. They are trusting their patient to our care. We do not want them to walk, walk away. We want them to continue to be involved. It may be very little, but the relationship is still there. And to make sure 
we keep that doctor on as the attending physician. We don't, we don't make people um, flip over to our hospice doctor. That's not necessary for hospice care. Federal regulations indicate that you can choose your hospice physician and it doesn't have to be the hospice doctor. So um, some hospices just want you to do that because it makes it easier and getting paperwork signed because they can do it in house. But we go through the lengths of, of um, connecting with your doctor so that they know what your plan of care is so that they can participate in that plan of care. That's really important. And then the second comment, I'm sorry. She said, that's, that's a soapbox for me. I think coordinating with nursing home with oh. hospice, the nursing home took precedence. And that's, that's unfortunate. Um, we should be working together um, and we should have the same goals. I think with, um, I, I hate using COVID as, as an excuse, but um, COVID has really thinned out um, the resources for nursing homes. And it really has put everybody in, in a heightened alert. And um, when we get, when we get scared and we're functioning with um, that heightened alert, I think we, um, we grab control a little bit stronger. Um, so there were times when in nursing homes, they wouldn't let anybody but the nurse in from the hospice program. And we, I tell you what, we lobbied and fought that the, the hospice and palliative care organizations across the country lobbied to, um, for nursing homes to allow us in because we are part of that care continuum. Um, and they started loosening it up a little bit, but um, our nurses uh, work, uh, attempt to work very well with nursing facilities. And um, we participate in care conferences. And if we ever feel that something's just not right, we call um, family meetings with the family and the uh, facility so that we're all on the same page. So we will help facilitate that. Thank you. This slide is a, um, it's a, a Venn diagram to show the circle of care. And you can see, the reading is very difficult. The hospice patient is in the center. Family and friends encompass the uh, hospice patient. And then our team is around that to help support you all in the ways that we do. I'm gonna go over some myths. Um, the myth is that hospice patients die within the next few days of bringing them into hospice. And the fact is we've actually had studies that, that prove that, and it was, um, pub this one particularly was published in the, um, uh, journal of, uh, the American medical association, JAMA, um, COPD patients referred to hospice lived considerable, um, considerably weeks to a month or two longer than those who weren't referred to hospice. Yeah. And it's because we, with hospice, we reduce medic unnecessary medications with side effects that we really don't realize we're having. And we make sure the patient's taking exactly what they need to be taking. And we provide social stimulation. All of a sudden we're honoring their life, we're offering hope, we're doing all the good things and their life is improving. And Deb, people can graduate from hospice, right? Absolutely. We actually have about 2% of our hospice patients for the first quarter of, um, I just presented these stats yesterday, for the first quarter of this year, graduated from hospice. And that is a good day. Yeah. That is a very good day. Medicare says that somebody needs to have a, oh, I have a typo, a prognosis of six months or less. The caveat is that Medicare is rethinking that because they realize that the earlier the referral, the better. And um, they're looking at increasing that to one year or less. Now, when we look at a patient and we say, could you, the question we ask is, would I be surprised if you remained alive in six months? Or conversely, would I be surprised if you died within six months? That's my first question that I ask myself when I meet a patient. In my head, I ask myself that. 
And if my answer is, I wouldn't be surprised if they were gone in six months, then I go into um, a fact finding mode. And I look at their medical history. I look at what's going on with them, identify what I think might be the cause of their death and talk it over with the doctor. And we deem whether the patient is eligible or not. Hospice can be incredibly beneficial if you have access to care longer because with increased lengths of time, you can get to know our team, our social worker, who doesn't just worry about finances. They are trained therapists. They work with grief, anticipatory grief. They work through some of the you know, unsettled feelings that someone's having. Spiritual support. It's not religious support. End of life spirituality very much comes into play for every person. Uh, Deb, when my when my husband was with hospice, I loved our nurse because she when she came, she would take all his vitals and everything, and then she'd be like, "I'm going to take yours too, Linda, because we <laughs> have to make sure you're okay." And it just made me feel like somebody cared about me too. Uh-huh. It was a, it was a big deal. It was a, a fabulous thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Because this is a family affair. It is very much a family affair. Another myth, hospice is a place where you go to die. Actually, hospice is a philosophy of care. Uh, We provide hospice services in homes, in assisted living facilities, anywhere that a person considers home, under a bridge, behind a warehouse. We have been proud to provide care to about, I don't know, maybe five or six homeless people in Pinellas County. And Everybody has the right to die with dignity. Yes. And that is what we profess for every single patient in Pinellas County, every single person in Pinellas County. Everybody has the right to die with dignity. It doesn't matter where you come from, what kind of housing you have, facility. You could, I could go to a mansion today and then I could go to a really um, difficult place in town and have to be very careful about my footing because the floor is just falling through. It, it doesn't matter. Everybody, everybody is entitled to that. Um, someone just said in the chat, my husband just transitioned from hospice to Suncoast supportive care, which will still provide access to what we were getting, a nurse and aid, a social worker for a sliding scale cost. Prior to starting hospice, I had great difficulty finding an aide who would just come in for an hour. They had a three-hour minimum, which was costly. Suncoast Hospice has relieved a lot of stress for us. Everyone has been so kind, compassionate, and helpful. That is correct. I have to say, we, Accent Care, Seasons Accent Care, I moved down from Maryland to open this hospice in 2016. I've been with Seasons Hospice for over 11 years. I've been a hospice nurse for uh, 22 years. And um, hospice is hospice. We're a family of providers. One thing that I noticed when I came down here, it wasn't a competitive environment. That's not the way we view it. Suncoast has done an amazing job in this county educating people on hospice. Yes. They really have. They've built, they're huge. They've built supportive uh, parts of their organization, such as this program, to give you what you need to help you in the home. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. They've done an amazing job. My hat's off to to Suncoast. Seasons Accent Care does hospice a little differently. We have the the, um, the, um, open access program, whereby we would... um, we would approve and pay for some things that aren't traditionally covered under Medicare hospice. Um, But for instance, if someone is end stage renal disease um, and they are on dialysis and they've relied on dialysis and their son's getting married in a month and they wanna continue their dialysis until the son gets married, Medicare doesn't pay for that. 
Hospices don't pay for that. But we have an open access program that will allow us to honor his wish, continue his life for as long as he can safely go receiving dialysis. And when he is ready to, to end dialysis and stop dialysis because he may not be um, receiving great benefit from it anymore, it may be causing more hurt than benefit, then we stop the dialysis. Yeah. You and know. all hospice is good. All yes. hospice is good. Like I, you're not there to be competitors. Oh you no. Work together and help each other. And I want people to understand that. Absolutely. Absolutely. We refer to different hospices all the time. Yeah. Um, like I said, Medicare guidelines require a prognosis of six months or less. When you sign into hospice, we assess you for eligibility and that lasts for six months. And then in another six months, we reassess for eligibility to make sure, because like I said, some people graduate and if they're, if you're eligible, we'll continue for another six months. And after those, um, first six, two, six months periods are over then we're going to go down to um, a, a, a 60 day. So a two month, I'm sorry, three months and three months. So that's your first six months. And then two months, we'll look, look every, every two months. Benefit periods are unlimited as long as the patient, excuse me, continues to qualify for hospice services. So when I look at somebody today and say, I think they're, they're going to have a life limiting illness in six months. And um, they don't, they don't, they don't die. They're, they're still here in six months. <laughs> when it comes time to research them in three months, the clock starts over. Okay. And I look forward six months. And then in three more months, I look forward six months. Okay. And then every two months afterwards, I, I put my glasses on to look forward six months based on decline that we've seen. So benefit periods are unlimited. Do we like to have people in service for years? Medicare looks at us very, very closely when we do that, so no. But if we have a good argument that somebody could have a sudden heart disease is perfect for this. You never know when somebody's gonna have a cardiac event especially for somebody who's debilitated. So I can argue that all day long. Example, we discharged a patient in my Baltimore program. Um, he had been on service for almost three years and he was young and he had this life-sustaining vest on and he didn't wear it all the time. Not two weeks after we discharged him, he died. Wow. You don't want to do that. Who pays for hospice? Medicare recipients. Medicare recipients are paid at 100% with no co-pays for all hospice-related care. When you sign consents for hospice, you are signing over the acute curative care part of your part of your Medicare benefit. And now everything is going into hospice. We get paid on a um, it's a um, just a daily rate. They don't pay us more for some people and less for other people. They pay us the same no matter, no matter what we do. Um, they've just started a reimbursement that pays us a little more at end of life because they know that we really, really um, put our arms around people at end of life. And it's, it is much more costly work. So they do, they have shifted the reimbursement for that. But it, 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 when people say, you know, oh, you get paid for more for this one or for that one. No, if people get their EOBs from Medicare and say, oh my gosh, they paid you this amount per day. I don't, I don't make that payment up. That, that is a Medicare payment that's been established by Medicare. Every single hospice gets that reimbursement. And that's what they've determined hospice care to cost. So um, when you elect services and you decline chaplain and music therapy and those kinds of things, it's all in the benefit. And it might seem like you're not getting a lot of care, but we cater that care around you. 
Many commercial insurance providers and most Medicaid plans cover hospice at little to no cost to the patient. You may have a little copay, most don't. Um, in the event that somebody does not have insurance coverage or their insurance does not cover hospice, um, we would do a financial assessment and um, determine ability to pay. If there is not a, an ability to pay, charity care is a big component of every hospice. We would never turn down anybody for inability to pay. We provide four levels of care, routine care, which is anywhere in the home. That's 80% that's of what we do. We offer respite. Medicare allows and will pay for five days of respite. In Pinellas County, Seasons Accent Care, we respite in our, our own hospice houses. Um, currently we have two of them. Um, sometimes if those houses are full, sometimes we could um, respite in a nursing home as long as it's Medicare certified, five days of respite. General inpatient. We have general inpatient care for the sickest of our sick. For somebody who needs a symptom to be managed and it cannot be managed in the current environment. So Suncoast did a really good, good job of teaching about hospice, the majority of people, the impression that uh, majority of people got is that you go to a hospice house and you die. Um, there was a lot of hospice house care that was provided and we provide, we don't provide that much because we manage the patient in there. We very much believe that somebody should age in place. Um, we will move a patient to our inpatient center if we really have difficulty um, managing the symptoms, agitation, shortness of breath, restlessness, abdominal pain, anything, um, we will move with permission, move them to our inpatient center. We also have crisis care, which is, um, is usually called continuous care, but I want to um, caution people. It is not continuous. It is minimally eight hours of care in your home. It can be up to 24 hours of care. And the hospice nurse is at bedside. Usually that nurse is a contracted nurse who is contracting with the hospice agency and they're monitoring the patient and giving the medications. That is only for a short period of time, a day or two or three to get symptoms managed. Same thing with general inpatient, a day or two or three. It's not to go to the hospice house to end the final days for a patient who's dying naturally and comfortably. Are there yes, any questions? Just said in the chat, respite was a good send, a godsend. Mm. Absolutely. And so many people decline respite. And we see people struggling and yet they decline. And we just, I, I wish... I wish people could trust respite a little bit better. Yeah. Okay, who initiates the referral? You or if you're the patient, um, if you're the POA or surrogate for an incapacitated family member, you can refer, just call hospice. Um, your doctor, the hospital, anybody. When we receive a referral, we'll um, initiate all the communication and include all the stakeholders in the process. And usually we see the caregiver or the patient within 24 hours. We like to do it same day. Some people don't want us to do it same day because everything seems to be rushing at them. So we do it as quickly as possible. Mm. And the last thing I want to leave you with is hospice is a gift. Hospice is a gift to you that you have someone in there to support you, to help you and your loved one reframe life, reframe hope. And it's not about, it's not so much about death and ending things. It's about supporting life for as long as life will support. Any more questions? Uh, 
I don't see any as of now. Um, can you put me back on the screen? Yes, let me see. No, you can stay. He's going to put me, my producer is going to add me to the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. So, see this teddy bear? Hassas made this teddy bear for me for my husband's shirt after he passed away. And I can't tell you how much this means to me, you know, to be able to have that. Um, hospice was a total gift. Like I said, you know, when the nurse came in, she would take my vitals too. And I can remember one day that she came in and she said to my husband, would you like music therapy? And he said, what's music therapy? And she said, somebody could come in and play a guitar for you. And he said, like Kumbaya? And she said, no, he could play Jimmy Buffett. My husband said, let me think about this for a minute. He said, I just thought about it. If I need music therapy, I'm going to put the temptations on really loud and Linda's going to dance. I said, I could do that. <laughs> I could do that. But it was, hospice made it better. Um, we knew my husband was dying. You know, you know, somebody's dying, but just having them there made it better. Uh, it, and, and, you know, Events never happen during the day. When you're having an issue, it's always two or three o'clock in the morning. And it always seems so worse at night. But for me to have that ability to be able to call someone, I'm going to cry now, to just be able to call someone and talk to them and know that I was not alone was really a big deal. And I hate to see people go through uh, end of life by themselves. Um, and not having the experience they could have. Linda, I think you make a very good point. Um, I, I started my career as an on-call nurse and um, one of my girlfriends that I used to do trauma nursing and she, she coerced me into coming into hospice because I was an emergency department administrator. I ran emergency departments. I was the, you know, the glory girl, I save them and all this stuff. And I really didn't want to work hospice. And Finally, I, I went to interview for hospice and I just, I, I knew it. Yeah. I felt it in my heart. I needed to be with hospice and I never looked back and it's the best thing I've ever done. And one of the things that she taught me as a new hospice nurse, she said, we're on call tonight and I'm covering North side and you're covering South side. And if you get overwhelmed, you call me because every single call we get in the middle of the night is a crisis because somebody doesn't know what to do. Yeah. And that's one thing I try to impress upon our nurses so much when you're on call, you know, it may be a simple fix for you, but it's huge for them yeah. and they need to reach out and they need us to be there yeah. and to answer. And when somebody calls twice, we automatically go automatically go. Even if they decline, say, no, 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 don't come out. Don't come out. I always reframe it to them. And I say, you know what? I'm worried. I want to take a look. I would feel better. I make yeah. it all about me. Yeah. And then go, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Somebody just said four days of respite care allowed me to attend a yoga retreat. I had prepared my husband for this change by appealing to our love and my need for a break. It was so sweet. When I picked him up, he said, I can leave him again if I need to go to an event. <laughs> <laughs> and then one person asked, can you please explain what palliative care is? Absolutely. Palliative care is care that bridges hospice and curative care. Um, back in the 90s, maybe, well, maybe a little bit later, um, we were, we were, a, home care agencies were establishing um, bridge programs. Everybody heard the term bridge program. And right. basically it was a home care program that bridged over to hospice it came to evolve to palliative care. Palliative care is not necessarily curative care. Um, palliative care will, um, if you want the textbook for palliative care, it's Medicare reimbursement for a lot more care than hospice. Um, they will do diagnostics, they will do all kinds of stuff, not necessarily curative, but we will, uh, they will palliate a symptom. Uh, palliate a tumor that's growing rapidly with some radiation. Um, it's, it gets a little mucky because palliative care in our name, we say hospice and palliative care. 
And that is our open access program. Um, we can palliate, we are not curative. I get referrals that say, this guy's got um, 10 more rounds of chemo that they would like to include um, under palliative. That's not palliative, that's cur curative. So then we have a conversation of what kind of care they're really looking for. So um, if you need palliative care for your loved one, um, look at hospice. Um, we will assess what you're looking for. Some people, all they want is some therapy and PTOT. Absolutely. We will do that to give some strengthening, safety training, that kind of stuff. A lot of stuff can go in that palliative basket. We also have a palliative care division that actually has a clinic up in um, Tarpon. So Fabulous. we keep them separate. Yeah. Someone said, my mother just passed and hospice was involved during her final days. Mother adored the staff from hospice. She talked about them as if they were family. I am thankful this service is available. And then another person said, one more thing. I lost my first husband to cancer when he was 40 and I had a toddler. Hospice hosted a grief support group which made a huge difference, connecting me to others who didn't give me that, how are you doing sad look. We talked about the daily and general things that we needed to do now as a single. And I think that's so important too. Absolutely. We have three new um, uh, support groups that we are opening up because uh, as I tell my team, hospice work is one-on-one. -on -one. Bereavement support is exponential. Right. You have one hospice patient and you have a family who need bereavement right. support. And that is exponential. So the more bereavement support we can get for individuals, so valuable. You know, when my mom passed away, well, this is a long time now, um, I went to a support group and it was just for <laughs> women who had lost their mothers. Mm -hmm. And the coolest thing was there was probably 15 in the group and nine of them, our mothers were born in Brooklyn. Because, you know, everybody from New York moves to Florida. Mm -hmm. um, but it gave me such peace. Yeah. And, and you know, it was my mother. And when you're talking about your mother, you want other people talking about their mothers. It was it was a really good thing. Right. Yeah. Right. And you have also have set pro programs for children, too. Right. We do. We have a bereavement camp called Camp Kangaroo. And that's for any child who has a loss. Um, whether it's a hospice related loss or not. And we hold that every year. Um, we've had to do it virtually through um, because of COVID the past couple of right. years, but um, we're going to open up again this year. Our first um, Camp Kangaroo was at the Clearwater um, Aquarium. Wow. So we try to do a really fun venue for the kids. They do a tremendous amount of, um, of uh, work, really hard bereavement work. Um, we staff it with our uh, PE staff, and uh, at the end of the two and a half day event, these kids have made friends. These yeah. kids have built a network, and they finish with a camp song. They actually build this camp song, and they sing it at the end of camp for everybody. It's just it's awesome. It, they really pour, pour their hearts out. Yeah, when my my two grandchildren when their dad died they went to a similar program to that and i know it was really a way for them to open up uh it really was a fabulous thing yeah so deb thank you so much for being with us today i so appreciate you i think a lot of people got good information here about um oh wait there's one last question let's let me ask if someone has cancer and is not taking treatment but appears healthy would that be palliative care Referral? Um, you know, it, it would depend. I would take a look. So many types of cancer can be in remission for a long, long period of time. So mm -hmm. it might be too early for hospice um, okay. or maybe they don't need palliative care either. It depends okay. on the person. And then um, one last question. What ages does your camp cover? We cover, oh my goodness, I think age... We have the uh, we have the smalls and the smalls are maybe six or eight, so it may start that that age and it goes up to I think we had some 15, 16 year olds. Okay, okay. One last comment. Thank you for this beautiful presentation. It reaffirmed my love for hospice and how amazing it is for our patients and families. 
Well, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. And, and this is my soapbox and this is my passion and I just love it. And Linda, thank you for offering uh, the opportunity to me to come on. Thank you, my friend. God bless you and have a delicious day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Ooh, now I got to like regroup myself here. It was a little teary there, but like I said, it's okay to cry. Tears are good. I tell that to my caregivers all the time.